Welcome back into Buccaneers Total Access. First half of the show, we had head coach Todd Bowles. Now I am so excited to be joined by assistant general manager John Spytek. John, thanks for being with us. Great to be here, Casey. And I mean, you, you got a good week to do it after that win. That was pretty incredible to talk about. I just feel like, what did that game mean to the whole organization and team after having a struggle against the, the Broncos to show the ability to come back like that? Well, you know, Coach, coach B.A. always talked about, you know, the good teams don't lose two games in a row. And, you know, we aspire obviously to be a good team. We think we've got a lot of pieces in place. And early in the year, you don't want to see, you know, one bad performance become two and then become three and four. And, you know, you have a, a big time opponent coming in like Philadelphia. We all know what they've accomplished the last couple of years. Got a great roster, a lot of great players that we respect. And it, we, we kind of attacked it all week like it's a great litmus test for us. Let's be about the right things and do the right things and put that performance behind us and realize we're better. And I felt like we showed that on Sunday. It also felt like each area got addressed in some ways that had been a struggle. And specifically, I know the sacks. That had been yeah. a number that was not as high as you guys would want. Six sacks in this game after just two in the first three weeks. What did you see working in this area so well in this game that maybe hadn't before? Number one, we had a lead. You know, Always when helpful. you score touchdowns and you get up two scores, the opposite of Denver. You don't have a lot of time to sack a quarterback when they're leading and they're dictating the kind of the, their terms. When you're up two scores late in the game, every pass rusher wants to be in the game. But I thought it was just, you know, I thought as, as poorly as we played across the board in Denver, we played great team ball against the Eagles. And, you know, every good rush, it works well with the coverage and vice versa. And, you know, when the quarterback has a hard time trying to figure out where to go with the ball or throw it to a guy that's covered, they usually hold it and then the guys get home. So, you know, we, we always, we were confident upstairs that we had the guys to do it. We had the scheme to do it. Obviously that's been proven over time. But it was good to see it come to fruition. You know, to see Levante get two is, of course, he is one of the greatest of all time, and we're so fortunate to be able to be a part of it and witness it. But to see Vita get back in the action and Yaya and Logan get one was was cool, and to see Nelly finish it off was great. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about Levante. I feel like he could deserve our entire yeah. show here, but hits the 1,500 tackle mark. Just he and Derek Brooks have done that in this franchise's history. Explain to us from even a scout's point of view of why this guy, why has he been the one to have this kind of a career and the level he's still playing at now, if you were to be scouting Levante from the other side? Um, he loves football. You know, I, I thought he, that interview he did with Carissa Thompson, he talked about, you know, the passion's got to be up here. And we, we have that as one of our traits of I am that man. And it might be really the foremost trait of what we're talking about. And I can remember going to Nebraska, you know, all those years ago, and them talking about this is the guy. This is the guy. He's only been here a short time because he was a JC kid, but um, the preparation, the desire to be great, the willingness to do the things that it takes to be great and not just say it. He, is, he, he was about that when he was young and he continues to prove it year after year after year here in Tampa. And you know, as a guy that loves players and loves watching great players, I always just feel fortunate to be around the great ones. And I've been so fortunate to be around a lot of great ones and Levante is, you know, near, if not at the top of that list. And I think Vita proved a little bit of his worth as well in this yeah. game of to watch a few without him, you know, and then to see the impact that one guy, now granted one very big guy, can make mm -hmm. on that defense. What was it like to watch him come back and knowing right off this injury just the impact he was able to make and, and the ways maybe we don't even realize how much he does that normally? Yeah, I mean, I give Gray Vita a lot of credit. I mean, he had a, had a real injury that's tough, and, you know, he, he obviously missed the one game, but he was determined not to let it become two games. He wanted to be out there for everybody, and especially against the team that we knew it was going to be a physical battle, especially when they're without, you know, two of their best, two of the, really two of the best receivers in the NFL. So for us, it was critical, and to see him dominate the way we know he's capable of dominating, um, I think a lot of times the dirty work that he does is taken for granted because he's not on a fantasy roster and... People don't focus on that as much, but I promise you, he dictates so much of what happens B-gap to B-gap, whether it's run or pass. And the offensive coordinators that we've spoken with, you know, the, interviewed the last several years, you know, obviously we've had some turnover there. Um, most of them come in and talk about Vita first. They <laughs> yeah. are very aware of him. And I'm sure when the Eagles saw him trending towards playing that way. They weren't super excited about yeah, that. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, let's look at the offensive side of things. Uh, Mike breaks the scoring rant, uh, record for yep. the franchise, which, I mean, man, I, only Jerry Rice, Emmitt Smith, and him. They're the only non-kickers to do that. That's pretty incredible company to be in. Tell me what that says about a guy like Mike. Consistency. I mean, you have to show up every day, week, 
year and produce. You know, those, this is not a, I went out one time and had a 300 yard receiving game, right? Like, you know, it was a, like a lightning in a bottle. This is a commitment to his craft, to the game, to the team, to the organization. And to do that is, is just so impressive. And I think sometimes you can take that for granted because he just sometimes makes it look so easy. And as scouts, I think we, we marvel at the things that these guys do that make, they, they make it look easy and we know implicitly how hard it is. And couldn't happen to a better person, couldn't happen to a more deserving person. And I hope he, I hope he keeps stacking on that, that record and putting it way out, way out in front of everybody else that is ever gonna chase him here. And we're talking to Assistant General Manager John Spitek. And I imagine for you guys, you've talked about the I am that man idea. And yep. to have people like Mike and Chris Godwin leading the wide receiver room in yep. particular, I, I feel like that's another thing that maybe we as Bucks fans take for granted of having guys like that in that position group for so long together here. And when you look at across the record books, everything is Mike one, Chris two, Mike one, Chris yep. two on every single category possible. To have those two guys at the same time, what does that do for this offense and the locker room? Well, I think the way that they prepare and play and the product that you see every week is a great bar for people to understand what it takes. Um, if you're a young person and you're not looking at Chris and Mike on offense and trying to emulate that, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, for a quarterback, you know, both Tom and Baker have talked about what, a, what an attractive place Tampa was because you have those two people. Not because they're great players, but because they're great people too. And the older I get and the, the more I'm in this, this profession, you realize that very often those two things are, you know, they're, they're equals. They, you can't really have one without the other in terms of what you bring to an organization, the consistency that it takes, and your level to, to produce year after year after year. I was actually teasing Jason um, a week or two ago and asked him, what does it feel like to have drafted the two greatest receivers in the history of an organization? Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. And it's not even up for debate, I don't think. I mean, they, they certainly are, and the numbers bear that out. And, you know, again, just fortunate to be around two great people that happen to also be great football players. I can tell that you guys obviously have faith in Baker as well, re-signing him this offseason. Through the first four games, watching him deal with, you know, the high highs of Lions and Eagles games and, and then the lows of the Broncos game. What have you seen from him both in his on-field production and then his leadership through this first four weeks? I think he's really found himself here. Um, he talked about that in training camp. Just there's, he's comfortable. Um, he's confident. You know, with Liam's offense, there's a lot more on his plate this year. And I, I know people like to say that they knew each other, and they, but it was brief. Yeah. You know, they, they had a, basically a cup of coffee in terms of the NFL life. And you know, Liam has, has challenged Baker to take the next step as a player and as a leader. And not that anybody's surprised around here, but Baker has risen to the challenge and is running with it. And you can feel his energy and his swagger that he always had. And when he was playing awesome football at Oklahoma, like that's what it was about. When he was playing really good football with the Browns, that's what he was about. And, you know, he was determined, I think maybe more than anybody, not to let that Denver performance affect the Eagles' performance. And that is what we're looking for from a quarterback and from a leader. Um, and, we're, you know, we just continue to be excited to have him. We're just grateful that he chose us and it worked out. And I know he, we see kind of, like you mentioned, the swagger and the leadership stuff of we see him throwing a stiff arm occasionally and nope. just the way he's one of the guys and, and his on-field production. But I also think that maybe he doesn't get enough credit for being the cerebral type of quarterback as well. What have you guys seen from him in the behind the scenes that we don't get to see in terms of meeting rooms and, and talking about games that he brings to it that is a little different than maybe the Baker we see on Sunday? He is extremely intelligent. He is a football uh, nerd. And I say that. Um, I Takes say one that, to know one. Well, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> absolutely that too. And I, I mean that as an absolute compliment. You know, when you tell him somebody's out of the game, right? Like uh, an Eagles player, he's, you know, in the tent, he might not go in. He knows instantly who's coming in. Um, and he knows the strengths and weaknesses of that player. Um, he understands football. He um, has the ability to process information really, really quickly, which to me is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, trait of playing quarterback. I mean, if people could actually understand how much he has to process from the time he gets in the huddle or the time he's approaching the huddle and Liam's reading him what feels to me like a novel sometimes yeah. to call the plays. I mean, this isn't two-word plays. These yeah. are sentences. And I always tell Liam, like, I, I could never be your quarterback. I couldn't remember that. To do it seamlessly, get to the line, change plays, change formations, and then still know actually where to go with the ball really quickly is, is a, it takes an elite thinker 
to do that. And last week I thought was a great example of it. I mean, he was on it from the day, from the moment that that ball got snapped, and um, he played like it through the whole game. All right, we're going to take a quick break here on Buccaneers Total Access. We are talking to Assistant General Manager John Svitek. Brought to you by Advent Health. This is Buccaneers Radio. Welcome back into Buccaneers Total Access. We are here with Assistant General Manager John Spytek. Uh, so we were talking offense, and I feel like we'd be remiss to not mention Rashad and Bucky, especially in this game. Man, if you're talking about trying to have a one-two punch, to have two guys with exactly 10 carries, 49 yards, same average, and both of them getting involved in the pass game as well. We see Bucky get his first career touchdown, yeah. technically twice. So uh, tell me what you saw specifically from those two guys in this game and what it could mean for what you are hoping to get out of the two of them moving forward. Well, I mean, they're, they're a great complement to each other. They, they do a lot of things similar. So when they're in the game, either one of them, they can, do, they can just, you know, it's, it's, it's trading equal parts, right? So we can just kind of keep running it. But they also can be in the game together and do just enough things different where, you know, when you see us getting like 21 pony would be the personnel group we call it when they're both out there together. You know, it, it, it's a challenge for defenses because they both can run it and they both can play in space. And... You know, with an offense a coordinator that's looking for matchup advantages and try to put the defense in stressful situations and play on our terms, those two guys as the interchangeable parts are, are awesome. And they've got a great relationship. You can see them on the sideline rooting for each other. Um, and that's really what we're about here. I mean, it's, it's, it's about the team, and those two guys embody that. And, and it was cool to see them both play a big play, big part in that game. You know, I give a lot of respect to Rashad. He obviously didn't feel well last week. He was on the injury report, and that – that kind of game, 105 heat index or whatever it was, coming off of an illness is not what you're looking for when no. you're when you're coming um, coming back from being sick. But he laid it on the line, and you know, props to him for that. And the offensive line, I know, a couple games had been a little rough on their end, gave, gave up a lot more sacks than they had wanted to, and then now this game felt like the protection and the run game so much closer to what you guys are, are hoping for, what they're shooting for. What did you see as the adjustments that they made, that Liam made, some things to help that line be a little bit more effective? Yeah, I think like offense is a is a everybody wants to throw throw it deep and play with a lead, and you know we didn't do that against Denver. We didn't have a lead. We we weren't able to throw it deep. And I thought last week was a good it was good complementary football. Right, we ran the ball, we spit the ball out to the perimeter on the quick game, pretty 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 fast. You know, the the run game and the quick game are the, the offensive lineman's best friends. It's really hard to sack a quarterback when he throws the ball in two seconds. It's really frustrating for a defense to chase a quarterback and get off the ball and try to pursue a quarterback and the ball's gone before they can even get there. I think that was one of Tom's foremost traits was he would frustrate and wear defenses down because you feel like you're about to get a good rush and the ball's gone and the ball's gone and the ball's gone over and over again. And, you know, I think good offenses, they play on their terms, but they'll, they'll spend some time taking what the defense gave them. And I think we started the game that way and we weren't afraid of the nine play 80 yard touchdown drives. Um, and it was, it was good to see everybody on the side of the ball bounce back. So now looking at this offseason, I mean, man, you guys had yourselves, had yourselves a year when it comes to that. I mean, re-signing everybody was just incredible. What did it take? I feel like it's so easy for fans to just be like, oh, sign this guy, trade this guy that, you know, for all of us playing with Monopoly money, it's an easy thing to think about. But what did it really truly take to bring, you know, Baker and Levante and Mike and Tristan and Antoine and get all of those guys signed in one offseason? It took, it took a big commitment from the Glazer family to, to you know, put the money up that was going to be required. I mean, it was no secret to any of us in this building that we were going to try to play some of the best players at their positions in the NFL and some of the most iconic bucks as well. And guys that aren't just iconic bucks, but still playing at an extremely high level too, which is, is, which is important. I think one of the things that we're most proud of here, and certainly I am, is we've created a, a culture and maybe a community that people want to be a part of. They don't want to leave it. They want to be here and they want to stay here. And when you go into negotiations with players that want to be here, it just makes things a little bit easier. Sure, we still have to find a deal. Um, and there can be tough conversations had that makes sense for everybody. We, I don't think we operate in a way that we want anybody to leave the negotiations or sign a contract they're not happy with. We want them to be happy with the deal that we got. We want to be happy with the deal we got. And when guys don't want to leave, and they all stood up there and said it on the, on the dais with Jason when, when he you know, did their press conferences, is it's imperative to holding a, a good team together. Otherwise, you develop all these young players, and they don't really love it here. They don't love part of the organization, and they just, for you know, $500,000 more, dollars, they might leave. I don't think we have that here. I think we've got the opposite. They, they, they'd leave a little bit of money on the table to stay if, if that's what it takes.
That's so, great. That's you know, great. And we, we, Jason's made no secret, like if you play and, and pr perform and conduct yourself in a manner that we love, he's got no issues and the Glazer family doesn't have any issues paying you. You, you get what you deserve. And, and then yeah. to me, every player should want to be a part of that. Yeah, and it, as you look at that group, I felt like they all embodied what you talk about, about that I am that man. Yeah. And so it does make sense of like, yeah, we got to reward this, that this is what we say we want. These guys have been that. So now we have to reward that. But I also know a big part of it is, again, the dollars, the cents, the contracts of all of it. Tell us a little bit about Mike Greenberg, Jackie Davidson, mm -hmm. the role that they play that I feel like they're the sort of unsung heroes a lot of times of where, you know, we get to hear from some of you guys in the front office more often in the media. They're the yeah. ones that, uh, that we don't always get a chance to hear from. Explain from your perspective, Jason's perspective, what they mean to what you guys have been able to do in recent years. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm smart enough. <laughs> you might have to have them down here next week to totally encapsulate yeah. everything they do. I would probably describe it as a massive jigsaw puzzle with all these pieces that you need to have and you're just not sure if you can cram them all into the finite amount of space yep. that you have. And you, you've got the amount of wiggle room you have is so small that if you make a mistake one place, it's going to be really hard to do you know, the next three pieces. So for them to be able to figure all that out and have such good relationships with the agents so that we can have the hard conversations and figure it all out and not get anybody get upset and be like, you know what, I'm just, it's time for me to go. Um, you know, that's their masters at the profession. Um, they rely on us to kind of give them a, well, he's kind of like this comp or this comp or this comp. And, you know, sometimes we're right. And sometimes what the market, that's what the market says. And sometimes we're not. And that doesn't mean that Jason or the Glazer family doesn't want them any less. And so they've got to figure it out. And the amount of things that go into a contract negotiation, it's so far beyond just, the money, it's, you know, we're not gonna sit here and bore you all with that, and nor am I smart enough to do it, but there's probably times 10 or 11 things that they're dealing with with any of those big deals like that. And they've gotta get them all right to make it work. It's amazing. And so now let's look through some of your rookies that you guys brought in as well. Um, incredible how much they have all been asked to contribute mm -hmm. early on, which is, I feel like a great sign of what you guys were able to do and, and the, the ready now mindset of, of so many of these picks. Um, let's start with Graham Barton, of course, and tell me what you've seen of his growth getting moved around to a position he's not as familiar with in addition to making the jump to the NFL and how he's handled all of that. None of us are surprised. Um, he has all the physical tools you would ever want for a great center, but more importantly is the mental aspect of it. And you know, he's a guy that doesn't get rattled. He's a guy that just keeps getting better day after day after day. You know, when in training camp, there were some days where he had some high snaps or, and I remember sitting up there talking in my short press conference being like, well, one doesn't become two, doesn't become four, doesn't become eight. You know, it's an isolated one here. And there's a ton on his plate too, mentally. And I think it's really hard for offensive linemen to play because the physical jump is massive, but the mental jump for a center is wild too. And you got a quarterback that's in a new system with being on top of it. So his his ability to kind of command that and make the checks is um, none of us are surprised, but it is impressive nonetheless. And then how about let's talk about uh, Chris Braswell a little bit. I know he has not been a guy who's been asked to do quite as much in the in the starting roles so far, but definitely still getting reps and in there. And we know outside linebacker not an easy position to. Uh, acclimate to Coach Bowles' scheme no. where you're asked to do a whole <laughs> lot. Um, so tell me what you guys' expectations are of him in, in the time he's going to be here. I thought he played his best game on Sunday against the, against the Eagles. We had a couple quarterback hits. He was back there with um, Levante on, on Levante's first sack. And, you know, he's a guy that just, he's just getting better every day. And in this world we live in, we want these guys to be elite players right now. I mean, I would actually like to count on rookies less than we've had to the last couple of years. But the contracts that we've done, the way we built this team, you know, when Tom was here and into here is necessitated that we rely on these guys a little bit more. But he is getting better every day in practice. You can see it. He's getting more confident. He's understanding the defense better, which Yaya has talked about as uh, was a challenge for him last year. And it's a challenge for all of these guys. And he is just about the right things, consistent, high effort. And, you know, I, the last week was a, good, was a good step for him. And I'm excited to see him play this weekend and expect more of it from him. So Tyke Smith, a guy who came in and from day one, everyone's just been talking about how intelligent he is from the football IQ standpoint, which is saying something again from a guy like Coach Bowles yep. doing that praise. So what have you guys seen from his development and his ability to step into that nickel position right away? It demands a lot. You know, he's a part of the run support. He's a part of the blitz package and he's certainly a part of the coverage. And, you know, nickel, a lot of times I think people, that's where you put a guy that can't play on the outside. I would say it's where you put the guy that 
has got a really great mind and is really tough. And Taiki is certainly both those things. Um, he just has fit in there seamlessly. He gets better every day. He doesn't make the same mistakes twice. He's tough. You can see that in run support. You know, the third play of the game, he hits Jalen Hurts the other day to kind of set the tone for the game. Um, and he's off to a great start. We just look forward to, to watching him compete more and more. And then Jalen McMillan, we know he missed this last game, but what have you seen so far from him to start in where he's gotten a lot of confidence and, you know, has in, seems like he's earned a lot of confidence from guys like Baker throwing to him, you know, early and often, especially preseason and then into week one. Yeah, I think he's, he's trying to learn as much as he can from those two guys in front of him, which, again, two of the best role models I could think of to, to become a, a high-end receiver in our league. And he just continues to show us what a natural he is at the position. Uh, just a very... You know, Baker told me one time, I can't figure out if he's running fast or he's just that, or he's running slow or he's just that smooth. And Baker was like, I think he's just that smooth. And I was like, he is just that smooth. He just, you know, the natural ability to turn your legs over and make the hard things look fairly easy. Um, you know, I mean, he's off to a great start, obviously, with the touchdown week one. He's made some big plays for us. And, um, you know, just keep emulating those two guys in front of him and he'll be on his way. I know we talked a little bit earlier about Bucky and Rashad together in their game, but let's let's talk a little bit more about Bucky as a rookie. And um, what are the unique things that made you guys look at his film in college and be like, yeah, this is a guy that could make a difference? Yeah, I, I go back to my my start in Philadelphia when Coach Reed was there, and you know his number one of his number one things was always feet. Look at the feet, whether we're talking about a lineman or a running back. And Bucky has great feet, and you can't teach great feet. And oftentimes, when you have great feet and great vision those two things give you a chance. And he happens to be a really smart, instinctive football player. He's really tough. You know, he's obviously not the biggest guy in the world, but when I love when backs finish in bounds. You know, he's had a couple opportunities with runs up the sidelines, and instead of stepping out of bounds, he will lower his shoulder and make the DB tackle him. And I've seen plenty of times in this league where you do that and the DB's not ready or he doesn't want to tackle you, and next thing you know, there's 15 more yards, maybe a touchdown. Um, you know, and there's, there's an energy when Bucky runs the ball that you really enjoy. And I think, you know, you can feel that in the stadium at home when they start chanting his name. Um, it's exciting when he gets the ball, and he was like that in college. Um, he's got some leadership traits that I don't think people totally understand, and he is a love it guy about football. And, you know, he's, he's been a great addition so far. All right, we're going to take one more break here on Buccaneers Total Access, and we are talking to Assistant General Manager John Spitek. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Advent Health. This is Buccaneers Radio. Welcome back into Buccaneers Total Access. We're talking to Assistant General Manager John Spitek. Tell me a little bit about, we hear about the scouting department a lot in the offseason, and then it's like everyone thinks you all go into hibernation, I feel yeah. like, during the season. Nope. We don't get to hear as much about what goes on now. So tell me during the season what it looks like for the department and the different sides of college and pro and, and what it looks like from just a, even a week-to-week -week basis of how you guys are setting the team up for success. Well, do we have an hour? Because it could take an hour. <laughs> yeah. but, um, Cliff notes. You know, two two. Two different departments running simultaneously. You know, I'll start with the college department. They're they're already on to the 2025 draft. They're making college. They're making visits. They're going to games. They are starting to get the board in place and, you know, basically set it in a way where this is the group of players here. This is the group of players here. So we can kind of, you know, Jason, myself, Mike Beal, Ron McCartney can start to work through it when we're not doing pro work. Um, we like to play the long game there. We don't need to have answers right now, but we need to be on our well on our way to get answers. And this this time of year for them the background information, the stuff that we rely on to pick the right kind of person into this organization is, is critical because you're getting face time with coaches and you know, staff in these different buildings. The pro side is very different this time of year. We are all about um, the upcoming opponent, preparing for them, the advances, uh, pre presenting to the coaches, talking with the different players, you know, different players that are interested in hearing about the players that they're gonna face that week, um, trends throughout the league, game management things. I mean, we, we've got our hands in a lot of it, but there's, a, there's an urgency right now to the pro side because it's week after week after week that there isn't in the college side. And so one of the reasons I love my job is I get to kind of bounce back and forth between the two of them. You know, if I need to just take a breather, you just go watch some college tape because those guys don't matter for another six months here. And you dive back into the pro stuff and it's like, well, here they come. They're coming this week, so we better be ready. And then with it being a short week, how does that affect what you guys have to do and need to do on the pro side? You know, I think it's much harder for the coaches. You know, you come off of a, a big win Sunday and, and you've got to get right back into Atlanta. We always work a week or two ahead. And so the, the three, four day difference in when we play the game doesn't matter as much to us. You know, our, our goal is to support the coaches and the players as much as we can this time of year. 
So we get them the, the, the information whenever they need it, however they need it, you know? And so it's just a little bit different rhythm and cadence to this week than typical, but our goal is always to give them the stuff they need to, to line up a great game plan and, and call a great game. Tell me if you were to be looking at one college player from start to finish, how many times are you talking to him? How many eyeballs are on him of what is that process of first discover? And maybe it's not a guy that's like as well known where it's mm -hmm. like everyone knows this is going to be a first round pick. One of your lesser known guys, what happens from start of you first learning about him to maybe drafting him? What does that process look like? It's, you know, there's, there's certainly the people that you become aware of when they're freshmen because they're that good. And you just got to kind of put them on the back burner for two years because they can't come to the NFL for them. But you spend some time gathering information on them, knowing you're going to need it eventually, and they're probably going to be a top pick. One of the things I always loved is when you're the first set of eyes on a player that maybe isn't being talked about very much, and you kind of go, like, I think I, think I might have something here. Like, no one's talking about this guy. None of my friends in my area are talking about him. He's not in any of the lists that we get. And then you start to kind of covertly go through it and get the information you need. And a lot of times you're in a room with six other scouts from other teams, and you don't want to, like, start – pointing the laser at this one guy and say like this is the guy now typically now they end up getting found out and but it, it's it's a fun like almost like adrenaline rush to be the first one in your organization to do it because that always I feel like that matters upstairs there's a competition that way to be like hey this this year this guy came out and I was the first one to put the big grade on him and then when you put the big grade on him and then the bosses see it as a young scout, you're like, oh boy, I hope they like him. Really I hope they like him. And I remember, remember that feeling when I was young. And then, you know, one of one of our bosses, maybe it was Jason, when I was with the Eagles, come down and be like, you know, I like that guy that you put the big grade on. You're like, all right, I, maybe I'm not bad at this. Yeah, so I love that. It's it's a very fun, it's a very fun feeling to be the first one. It's hard to do because there's so much information on all these kids now for years and years and years, and they're talking about them on ESPN and all that stuff. But, you know, if you're looking at the right things, you can still find them. We're talking assistant general manager John Spitek. Let's talk a little bit about this Falcons game coming up. Uh, they're a team that they, their their scouting department was busy this off season as well. Mm -hmm. They uh, made some changes, brought some new people in. Um, Kirk Cousins joining the Falcons. In your mind, what was that when you first heard about that, and, and what you've seen so far of how that's changed the dynamic of this team that we're going to be facing? Very accomplished quarterback. Uh, played a lot of good football for a long time. Very productive. You know, doesn't turn it over a lot. You know. Was I happy that the Falcons signed him? No. I mean, like, we'd, we'd rather play against, you know, three quarterbacks in our division that we don't think can play. But that's also not the reality of the NFL. I mean, yep. you're going to play against good players. And so I think anytime a team has a solid starting to good quarterback, they're going to be relevant because that guy's going to figure out a way to make them relevant. And then when you have pieces around them, they become a little bit more scary. And so, you know, I, we don't like to see other teams in our division making good decisions. You know, we kind of, <laughs> ugh. But, you know. Also, the reality is they're going to. Yeah, and so they also have some of those pieces you talked about yep. around him. So let's talk, first of all, the run game between B. John Robinson and Ty Tyler Algier. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the best one to punch outside of, of course, we're partial to our Rashad and Bucky, yeah, but uh, outside of our guys, maybe the best one to punch you guys will face in that area? Detroit was pretty good, too. Yep. But these guys are also very good. Bijan, obviously, a top 10 pick um, for running backs has a lot. He is a dynamic player that. You know, you get that feeling when he gets the ball. This is how we always felt about Alvin Kamara, uh, have always felt about Alvin Kamara, is when he gets the ball, just get him on the ground, get him on the ground, get him on the ground. You know, and you, you know they're, you know they're going to make big plays. They're just too good not to. But you can't let the 10-yard run become 50. you got to find ways to get him on the ground. And he's a nice compliment to, to Algier because Algier is more of the bruiser, physical, and so they're, they're kind of a change of pace type things. But they both can do the same runs, which can be tricky too. So... A lot of respect for both those guys. We're going to have to play well up front and, and bottle those guys up. And tell me about Raheem Morris stepping into this role. What was your reaction when you heard he was going to be taking over, and what do we know about what he brings to his teams? He brings a lot of juice. You know, there's a lot of people around here that know him well. I've obviously gotten to know him a little bit through some of the guys upstairs that know him well. Um, great energy. Guys are going to play hard. Great defensive coach. And, and really, like, you know, his, his global understanding, given all the different uh, positions he's coached and positions he's had, he really understands – the totality of a football team. You know, a lot of times coaches, I think, get offense or defense, just like scouts can become college or pro. He's lived a different journey with that. And so, you know, I think the thing that you, you can really feel this year is the energy they play with, and it certainly comes from, from him. 
And how about their defense? What stands out to you about them, knowing they've got some talented guys at, at every level? Mm -hmm. Grady Jarrett, number one. He's been a great player for a long time in this league that we have a, uh, the utmost respect for. He is a, a game wrecker that if you don't get blocked, he's going to be a problem. And he's hard to get blocked because he's a good player. I mean, that's what good players do. And then I think you go back a couple letters behind him. Jesse Bates is a guy. And Justin Simmons there now, too, are two safeties that are very smart. They're going to keep the ball in front of them. And they're going to take advantage of bad, bad plays on you. And, and usually if you throw in their area and it's, it's not accurate or it's not on time, it becomes a turnover. And that's, that's what can beat you in this league. And they're, they've both already proven that this year. And, um, you know, we got to know where they are and we got to, we got to keep the ball away from them. Looking at this roster you guys have built for this season, what are the things that you guys as a department are maybe most proud of about the group you put together? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of the last two draft classes. You know, we've talked about the fact that they've all made the roster, um, but they've deserved to make the roster. And they've, they've contributed in their own way and they're good teammates. And, you know, we've had to rely on them to, to keep this thing moving the way we wanted it to do. And, you know, as a scouting staff, I think we we're proud of that because finding players that are young but ready to play and produce in this league at a level that's required to win is hard. And yes, it takes physical talent, but it takes a lot of mental fortitude and talent as well. And that's where really I give our scouts a ton of credit. They, they spend this time of year finding the right information. So when we go to pick them in April, or really when we start stacking the draft board in February and pick them in April, we know that we have the right person to help us. You know, whether they're forced to start right away like Graham or Taiki, or whether they can play a role or spell somebody like Chris and Bucky and Jalen right now, we have a lot of confidence in that. And, um, you know, I'm proud of our guys and girls in the scouting department for that, and, and I'm proud of the, the, the players too for, for uphold, making us look smart. <laughs> well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I know it's a crazy week uh, coming off the hurricane and going into a short week, so we really do appreciate it, and uh, congrats on that big win this yeah, week. I appreciate it. It's always fun to beat the Eagles where I got my oh, start. Oh, heck yeah, so, over yeah. and over. Let's keep doing it. Much, res right. much respect to Philly, though. That's true. We, we love them, and we also love beating them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for joining us here on Buccaneers Total Access. We are brought to you by Advent Health. This is Buccaneers Radio.